Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, and Chris Smith. Coming up on DTNS, why chip shortages are a good thing for the Xbox, software to ease your back pain, and the most important things to know from the avalanche of tech earnings this week. DTNS starts now! This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 29th, my sister's birthday, 2022. Happy birthday, Meg. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, co-host of the Snob OS podcast and the Tech John, Terrence Gaines, a.k.a. Brother Tech. Welcome back. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing me here and sweating a little bit in the pre-show because I was kind of <laughs> No one needs to know. Hey. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Terrence has always been here. I don't know what y'all are Behind the about. curtain. <laughs> Behind the curtain, Terrence. All right. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters sources say that Elon Musk is said to have secured loans for his pending acquisition of Twitter. A little more than half of the offer price is made up of $25.5 billion in loans. Musk supposedly said he would reduce executive and board pay, cutting other costs internally. Twitter has relatively large gross margins, leaving potential room to cut. Musk also promised to develop new ways to monetize tweets, such as charging for third parties to embed tweets from verified individuals. The sources also said that Musk has lined up a new CEO for Twitter. Parag Agrawal took over for Jack Dorsey in November of 2021 and will remain a CEO until the acquisition closes later this year. The South China Morning Post sources say China will hold a symposium with the country's largest tech firms after Labor Day to assure executives that the government plans to ease its crackdown on big tech. Prior to the symposium, the government will reportedly hold a joint regulatory meeting to put all regulators on the same page so that they all know they're easing up on big tech. At a meeting of China's Politburo on April 29th, the government said it will normalize control over the tech sector and design measures to support it. Short version of this is, oh, this is affecting our economy. Maybe we should ease off. A report by research from the University of Washington, UC Davis, UC Irvine, and Northeastern University claims that Amazon and third parties collect processed transcripts from interactions with Amazon's voice assistant to send to advertising partners. This data is used for to infer user interests for ad targeting on Echo devices and also the web. Amazon confirmed that it does serve targeted ads on its smart speakers, but does not share voice recordings with developers. In December, participants in the Pwn to Own competition identified several security bugs in NetTalk. That's an open source protocol that can act as Apple Share file servers for Mac OS clients. A lot, lot of software uses it. NetTalk patched the vulnerability in the March 22nd version, uh, the 3.1.1 release. And Thursday, Synology warned users that some of its NetTalk as appliances are exposed to multiple NetTalk vulnerabilities. Synology says patches are ongoing and should arrive within 90 days of the advisory at the latest. The vulnerabilities have already been fixed for Synology appliances running Disk Station Manager 7.1 or later. So if you're on that and you're up to date, you should be all right. Earlier this week, QNAP advised its NAS users to turn off Apple File Protocol on its devices until patches can be issued. Epic Games acquired Bandcamp just last month. I know it seems like a lifetime ago, but it was a month ago. Now <laughs> Epic is filing a so motion for, <laughs> I know, for a preliminary injunction to stop Google from removing Bandcamp band camp rather from the google play store digital music sales had been exempted from using google's billing system but a policy change requires apps to use play billing as of june 1st of this year all right let's talk about game consoles protocols nick stat has an article up theorizing that chip shortages are helping xbox close the gap with the playstation and yet they may not need that help uh, it's been a good week for Xbox. MPD Group estimates it had its best March in 11 years. MPD Group does console sales monthly. And during Microsoft's earnings call, the company claimed it had taken market share from the PlayStation for two consecutive quarters. They didn't give any numbers to back that up, but, you know, that's what they said. And it's in an earnings call, so it's, you know, subject to some regulatory assurances. So it's probably true. Uh, Microsoft says the Series S and the Series X have sold faster than any previous Xbox generation. 
and hardware revenue was reported up 14% on the year. Uh, if you do some tea leaf reading, uh, estimates are that Microsoft has sold between 10 and 12 million Xbox Series units. Sony last reported its sales in February, and at that point, the PS5 was about 17 million units. Stat points out that those numbers still have Xbox on the same sales pace as the Xbox One. It's just that the PlayStation 5 is selling a little slower than the PlayStation 4 did. However, if Sony is having a harder time getting chips, which it appears it might be, that would mean Microsoft is closing the gap on it because of the chip shortage. Anecdotally, Stat notes that friends, and I've known some friends who say the same thing, have bought an Xbox only because it was easier to find and cheaper on the secondary market. PlayStations are still going for about twice what retail is. However, Stat points out that None of this may matter that much for Microsoft, which is less reliant on the console install base than it used to be. Uh, things like cross saves and cross buying mean that players can move between the console and the PC using Xbox Game Pass relatively easily. And with cloud streaming, you can even just play on mobile. Game Pass subscribers increased 45% on the year, so it's booming. Microsoft Future now heavily relies on serving people who might not ever buy a console or even possibly a PC. That leaves the market looking like this. Nintendo is the king of unit sales. So if you just want to count the number of consoles, Nintendo wins. Uh, but it's often because it's a secondary console. People might buy the PlayStation and the Xbox or, or one of the other, PlayStation or the Xbox, and also a Switch. Uh, Sony still brings in about half of console consumer spending because even though PS5s may not be selling as fast as they'd like, they have a huge PS4 install base. But Microsoft has the early lead position in a device agnostic world, in a world that's switching to subscriptions. Terrence, if, if you were a console maker, who of these three would you rather be right now, do you think? Me, if I was a greedy person, <laughs> it would be Sony. You, you, you could be, be whoever you want. Yeah, right, Sony. Right. Okay, why, why is that? Um, because they're harder to get, therefore the demand is higher, therefore people are going to be scraping and scrounging to get these. So whenever the chip shortage kind of eases up or they get to produce more products, I think those are going to fly off the shelves way faster than an Xbox or a uh, Nintendo Switch. Yeah, but I mean, but you, if you look at the Xbox Game Pass numbers... Clearly, people are like, okay, uh, maybe hardware is a little difficult right now. Let's let's do something that's a little bit more platform agnostic. And Microsoft is really reaping the rewards. Those camps are pretty tough in the console wars. I don't see that easing up anytime soon, even if there's more options to go cross-platform. It's something about you know, Xbox versus PlayStation, it keeps these things going. That's just my opinion. Though. Yeah, and, and I think you're right in the short term, for sure. Uh, it, it does look bad for, for Sony that their unit sales can't catch up because of supplies. And and that supply shortage does seem to be dragging on a little longer than people thought of because new problems keep cropping up. Uh, we're going to talk about that quite a bit when we talk about earnings later. Uh, but even so, eventually the supply shortage will work itself out. And when it does... I think a lot of people will, you know, give up their PS4 for the PS5. I don't think there's going to be as many people who are going Switch. to give up Sony now right. because they can get an Xbox. There are a few, anecdotally, like Stat said. Uh, but I think down the road, Microsoft does have the longer-term advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will add that uh, uh, Microsoft definitely has a broader advantage because... A subscription is something you can get as a Christmas present, but you don't necessarily need to go hunt through every Target, Best Buy, or eBay sale to get one. Um, and the same thing will apply to people who are just tangentially interested. They don't necessarily want to plunk down four or 500 bucks and then all the associated peripherals, which is what hardcore gamers would do. But, I mean, if you're looking at, I want to appeal to a broad mm. base, you're going to have to look outside that core demographic. It's easier because, to acquire new customers, right? Because exactly. they don't have to fight to get the console. Yeah. Hmm. For that, and then you just have Mindshare, right? It's a brand name. It's on the tip of your tongue. Sure, sure. I think it is going to be fun to watch. <laughs> I really do. All right, let's uh, let's improve our posture, Sarah. Let's do it. A company called Zen, uh, you've either heard of it, maybe you even use it, uses posture mirroring software to send alerts when it detects that you're not sitting up straight. You're not giving your body a rest so you can correct your posture and avoid physical pain while doing your job as you're hunched over your computer, <laughs> likely at home. But 
it, to do so, it uses your webcam to check on your posture, which might raise some eyebrows from folks who'd like better posture but don't want to be watched all day. Zen also sells a version of its software to employers and has signed uh, about 30 companies, some of them enterprise, so a lot of employees there, since it launched in October of 2020. That might raise even more eyebrows, such as, hmm, is my employer using the tool to check on me? To see when I'm at my computer? To see when I'm not? To see when I walk around? See how often I'm doing work, etc.? Now, Zen says it's taken a privacy-centric approach to building this webcam-based posture-correcting tech with its posture correction software being open source, except for exercise and educational content, which is something that Zen says it does customly. Zen's AI also processes data locally, that's on device, meaning that it's not uploading or streaming any data to any cloud. You can test their claim by using it with your Wi-Fi or internet connection disabled if you don't believe them or feel, you know, paranoid, which many people do. Also, it doesn't record or store any visuals. So employers only receive an aggregated total number of how many employees sign up to the app, how many use it on a weekly basis, not exactly who the, those employees are or what time of day we're, you know, moving into this. Also, the software is designed so you don't have to keep it on all the time. You can check in just a couple times a day, which may be enough to keep you aware of your posture. Zen says that most users do like a 30 to 60 minute posture session in the morning, maybe another in the afternoon. That's enough to keep people aware of their posture all day. And some say they even think of it at home and at the dinner table and such. So in some ways, that's really great, especially those of us who've, you know, had RSI injuries or, you know, other stuff um, from kind of not having great posture while we're doing our work. When it is running, a stick person icon is displayed in the menu bar, mirroring the user's posture, turning blue when it's good, red when it is correcting. The algorithm uses each user as a baseline, meaning that what you d demonstrate as upright will be what it tells you to work for. And that's, that's, that's specific to you. It's not some crowdsourced uh, ideal because everybody's different. Right now, Zen is $3.99 per month or $23.99 per year, although the company plans to switch to a freemium model when you pay for advanced features. It also plans to get into selling things like ergonomic chairs, keyboards, mice, and things like that for people who care about these things, as well as integrate movement sensors from wearables like headphones and watches. Man, I, I was watching Nick with a C in our chat room who was like, sounds like spyware. And then Sarah said, like, it's all on device. Uh, you can turn off your internet to prove it. And, and then he's like, I don't know. Those alerts sound like they might be annoying. And then you're like, most people only use it twice a day. You don't have to have it constantly <laughs> alerting to you. I feel like this, this company has tried to do everything possible to anticipate what your objection would be to using their software uh, and and make it so that it's not annoying, but just helpful. However, one of the people I know has got a keen eye for finding out whether there's loopholes and all that is Terrence Gaines. Terrence, what, what do you think of this? <laughs> well, not necessarily loophole, but of course, companies are going to want to use this information. Now, again, Sarah said, you know, in the in the in the breakdown that, you know, they are it's not safe to the cloud. Uh, the only notifications users, uh, employers are getting is how many people use it and maybe how often they use it. But still, that's not going to stop people from thinking or assuming or taking something and putting it over the <laughs> camera because this thing is installed. Um, I don't see this as being a big deal outside of um, me being frustrated with myself because I can never get my posture straight. I could see that thing going red all the time. And then in the first couple of times, I would try to straighten up and fix myself. But then I would just get annoyed because I can never stay that way. And I know, you know, you're suppo it's supposed to fight that, but it's just like, ah, that's too much work. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the person, right? Because they, they, they had interviews with some people in this uh, article that that showed that, you know, if you just had it on for 30 minutes, constantly correcting you, you could turn it off, you could cover your camera, and you just sort of get in the habit of doing it anyway. Some people were even saying they were doing it at home, you know, uh, so like, like Sarah said, however, that's not going to work for everybody. Right. Uh, and, and you may, you may, when I say you, I'm not talking to you specifically, Terrence, I'm just saying like one may be the exception, uh, to that. Uh, mm -hmm. but it probably works 
for enough people to make this worthwhile. And I have a really good chair that's helped my posture, but I do try to remind myself to also, you know, straighten up because I, I somehow have figured out how to slump even in a good chair. Yep. Um, oh, go ahead, Sarah. No, no, I, I was just going to say, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I, I have definite repetitive stress injury on my right hand. Um, mm. It kind of comes and goes. Sometimes it's really bad. Mm. Sometimes it's not as bad. And it all has to do with my posture. Mm -hmm. You think like, oh, is it because I'm using my you know, hand in a way that's you know, not great? No, it actually has to do with my, um, my monitor placement it has to be up high enough. I have to be sitting up straight. I have to do all these things. And if I do all those things correctly, I'm okay. But if I don't, I'm not okay. So uh, you know, I, I understand that there's some privacy implications that people are going to have to, you know, decide if uh, they're comfortable or not, you know, using something like Zen. But this is actually something that I feel like is really important to many of us, especially before you get hurt. Because once you get hurt, it's a lot harder to not be hurt anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, this. Th let us know if any of you are using this in your workplace, or you just decide to try it out uh, on your own. Uh, especially if it, once it goes freemium, it'll be you know low cost to try out. I'm curious what they're going to charge you for. Uh, I've, uh, I, I, I wonder how useful it is for free. But we'll we'll see. Especially because they're not supposedly getting any data, so they can't monetize your data if that's the case. Uh, but if any of you use it, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we also love to hear from you on our subreddit. The reason we had that Synology story in there was because R.W. Nash uh, posted it to our subreddit today and folks voted it up. Uh, you can help figure out what goes on the show by using our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. It was a big week for tech earnings reports, but rather than get lost in all those numbers, we thought we dive a little deeper into a few of the bigger implications that came out of them. Uh, first, keep in mind the situation these companies are all in. And you know all this stuff, but it's worth reminding global inflation, possible interest rate rises to combat that inflation, and thus possibly a recession on the horizon. Consumers know all this, and consumers are therefore being cautious, even if they're not impacted immediately. That's a drag on sales, especially for expensive tech products. There's also the fact that as we venture out more now, we're consuming fewer things online, and there's an inevitable adjustment from the sky-high numbers of 2020 and 2021 for those companies that benefited from lockdowns, Netflix and Amazon, for example. There's also a war in Ukraine, which is impacting supply lines, causing companies to cut business in Russia and be unable to serve customers in Ukraine in some cases. And that introduces more financial uncertainty, as well as just financial uncertainty in general in the populace. There are also massive lockdowns in China as COVID-19 surges there among a population that was not exposed to previous waves and whose vaccinations are proving less effective than one might have hoped. Ad-based businesses are taking some of the biggest hits. YouTube grew 14%, which may sound like a lot, but it's quite a bit lower than they expected, quite a bit lower than usual. Facebook rose its advertising 6.1%, and that is its slowest growth in the 10 years since it went public. In fact, almost all tech companies reported some kind of revenue or profitability hit, sometimes both. Even Apple, which reported record numbers, didn't have a rosy forecast for the current quarter. Apple CFO Luca Maestri said supply chain issues, mostly related to lockdowns in China, would reduce sales by 4 to $8 billion in Q2. On the one hand, CEO Tim Cook said that almost all factories in China that assemble its products are back to work. Wall Street Journal bears that out with reports that several Apple suppliers, including Luxshare and Wistron, were granted COVID-free status by the government in China. That gives them priority to resume production. And Apple did not seem worried about demand for its phones, likely bolstered by the fact that while worldwide smartphone shipments fell 11% last quarter, Apple's phone shipments grew 1%. But still, despite all that, oh, the factories are coming back. We don't expect phone sales to get hit. Apple would not forecast revenue for next quarter or say when it expected its supply chain issues to ease. Intel also forecast a weak Q2 because of supply chain issues. Amazon, on the other hand, had a low forecast, but in their case, it was due to higher costs. Amazon revenue grew at its slowest rate since 2001. Uh, you know, 2001, that's when Pets.com went bust. Uh, Amazon ran on thin margins for most of its history, and it's back to that. But this time, it's not caused by spending on expansion, 
but on increasing costs, particularly fuel costs. They've started to charge shippers who use their service a fuel surcharge. Insider Intelligence estimates Amazon's market share grew 0.2% in 2021. That's its slowest growth rate in years. But let's end on a bright note. Cloud. Look to the clouds. Amazon is powered by AWS, its cloud services division, and cloud services is booming for everybody. Synager Research figures the total cloud services market rose 34% on the year to reach $53 billion. Amazon has pretty much been at about a third of that market share uh, for years now, and it stayed there, hovering around 33%. Microsoft inched forward from 20 to 22% of the market, followed by Google at 10%, and then everybody else. Uh, Canalys had similar numbers and pretty much identical rankings. Uh, so that's the layout. Bad, bad week for big tech. Couple bright spots and uh, nothing but but cloud on the future, both good and bad. Uh, Terrence, what do you think? I don't know. Um, is am I tripping or are all these companies? Uh, I don't know. They, I'm pretty sure they got forecasters. They've got people that kind of see all these things happening or coming down the pike. And are, but are they really acting on it? Because it seems like they're just go go go. And then when the numbers come out, they're like, "Are y'all going to hit us hard for revenue and all these profitability and things to go down?" Mm. I, it's just like I, it just seems like they were just go go go. And then now the wall is looking to come to the wall. And I don't see too many companies outside of, like you said, going to the cloud, doing other things to kind of prep for that. Or am I am I making that up? I think that uh, quite a few companies, Amazon is an obvious uh, example of this, but quite a few companies during the pandemic, when a lot of people shifted how we do things day to day globally, um, enjoyed the repercussions of that. Right, they, you know, all of a sudden it's like, wow, look at look 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 at our numbers. But that wasn't going to last forever, and we certainly, you know, as you mentioned, Tom, you know, depending on where you live in the world, there's there's no sort of like COVID's over type thing going on here at all. But there's a little bit more of going back to life that is going on, and all these companies are now feeling that and having to. Uh, I don't know, back up their claim that they're going to be okay in the future. I think it's it's probably if you're if you're a company of a certain size and you have, you know, just like exponential growth because of something that is happening that's largely outside of your control, but it's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. You just kind of hope it's going to stay that way. Yeah. And it won't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I, these are battleships, right? And they, they're slow to turn. That's always the problem with a big company. Uh, the reason people get upset about big companies when they're doing well is their battleships and they're hard to oppose. But as soon as those waters get choppy and they need to turn, they turn slow. Uh, so, so yeah. you're not wrong, Terrence. They, they, they're all trying new things, but the bigger the company is, the slower those new things are to try. And they're all still trying the new things that they started a couple of years ago before the world got as choppy as it is now. And it's harder for them to innovate. This is something I've been kind of talking about for years, which is, look, these big companies are a really big and successful right now, but none of them ever stay that way. The big companies that were successful in 1999 are not the same big companies that are successful now. Or if they're, they are like Microsoft, they had, they went way down and had to come way back with something entirely different, going from being an operating system based company to being a cloud services based company in Microsoft's case. So what we're seeing right now is there usually is something unexpected happens in the world uh, that is harder for a big company to adapt to because they're so have so much momentum behind what made them good. And that's where that advertising number starts to look really interesting, which is the problem a lot of people have with big tech is, well, they get all this ad money and they monetize our data and there's no way to get them off the, the ad money. Well, if the ad money does start to dry up, it's going to force them to try other things, which then opens up a place in the market for smaller companies to out innovate them. Uh, which brings us back to your point, Terrence. Uh, this is the time for the small company to jump up and go, we can move faster. 
Yeah. And I wish I was a battleship when I went to my, if I go to my mortgage company and say, Hey, I lost my job. I'm a battleship. Yeah. Uh, work yeah. with me. <laughs> you're, you're just a cruiser if, or, or a PT boat, you know, right. most of, most of us are right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's finish up with some fun stuff. Sarah, what do you got? Let's do it. Uh, we talked recently about the subscription based cancellation service for other subscriptions called Truebill. And a few of you wrote in to us about your experiences with that. So thank you in advance. How good is it at helping you actually cancel things you probably shouldn't be paying for is the big question. Well, now the company is sharing some data on where cancellations do happen the most subscriptions for Audible. Time Magazine, Amazon Kindle, The New York Times, and Been Verified have cancellation rates above 50%, with Audible specifically at 18%. Truebill Chief Revenue Officer Yaha Mokhtarzada says that subscriptions with higher cancellation rates tend to be in two categories. The first one, people signed up for an aspirational subscription. Maybe you signed up for a gym. You wanted to you know, lose weight or get in shape. Maybe you've got an audiobook membership. And the second is the sneaky subscription, which might involve, you know, all of a sudden you're now part of a fashion subscription monthly, maybe in-flight Wi-Fi, slipped through the cracks, didn't really know you were signing up for it. Truebill also found subscriptions that have cancellation rates between 1% and 2%, so that's quite lower, including productivity services like Wix, Squarespace, Dropbox, and Zoom, streaming and entertainment services like Twitch, Xbox Game Pass, hmm. uh, Blizzard Entertainment, and also financial subscriptions like Stash and Wealthfront. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense to me that, that the stuff that you use to, to run your website, keep your files in for work. Uh, yeah, you those, tend to those, need to keep that active. Yeah, yeah. Those would, those would be the, the stealthy ones. The thing that just jumped out at me and we we like we've had this in the rundown for hours and it just jumped out at me, Sarah, when, when you were telling us about this. Time magazine gets enough subscriptions online that it can have a high cancellation rate. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, apparently a lot of people want it and then yeah. they don't. It probably has to do with like, you know, Time Magazine Person of the Year. You know, there there's certain cyclical things that I think are hmm. probably at play here. Yeah, yeah. Or or, you know, maybe there's some, you know, time has offered people a deal and they end up, you know, subscribing and then they decide that they can find and, all that information online somewhere else. Well, I think it's time.com that's getting the subscriptions, right? Yeah. Probably yeah, yeah. not the print magazine as much anymore. But that still, I I wouldn't have thought that would be high enough to rank with Audible and Kindle because you may say like, well, yeah, but they're canceling, Tom. Audible, the high cancellation rates, True Bill explained this in the protocol interview, the high cancellation rates are actually a good sign for companies in a lot of cases because it means they're getting enough people trying the service that that they have a high cancellation rate, but they still keep the rest sure. of the people. Yeah. And they it's build high an interest. Audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I was just <laughs> smiling as soon as Sarah started reading this. Oh, I, I see where this is going. Uh, ultimately, the stuff like people wanting to read <laughs> or actually exercise or do better <laughs> the aspirational stuff is like high cancellations for that up until i mean that's like, that's like the gym membership on january 1st right right, right you know right, where you go I, my yeah. intentions are good but come march 1st have i really been going no so, so it's don't almost pay like for a, it yeah it's like a snapshot of uh real life then mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. the stuff we need for work and the stuff that lets us sit on the couch <laughs> right <laughs> those are the ones we're not we're not canceling that's true <laughs> all right let's check out the mailbag uh, this one comes in from Kome. Kome says, uh, and this is in response to our Snap Pixie conversation we had yesterday. Kome says, I'm a drone enthusiast. I have seven functioning drones at the moment. Snap's Pixie reminded me of a few drone projects that I backed on Kickstarter in an Indiegogo long time ago, including one called Self Fly from 2007 that's similar to Pixie. Kome says, I never received the product and I assume the project was dead, but I have to check. But after five years, I'm glad this type of drone finally became available from a major company. Second note, uh, Kome says, is my smallest drone is 105 grams, about the same as Pixie. When I fly indoors for testing, all the napkins on the table fly everywhere. Even a small drone can make quite a mess if people decide to fly it indoors. Something to consider. The design of Pixie looks safe, says Kome, but one of the disasters that can happen with a drone 
is long hair sucked into the propeller. It can get tangled badly. I believe Pixie can't prevent that if it only has front and bottom facing cameras. Oh, well, I don't know that that's true. Uh, it it do, does seem that it's able to fly its flight path with those sensors. So there may be there may be more going on uh, with those two sensors than than it looks like uh, at first. I, I wouldn't want to say one way or the other, to be honest. But it's no joke that get, that if it, if it if you get too close to a propeller with long hair, that, that's not going to be good for you. I mean, listen, I've got a Roomba, and I mean the number one thing I do is clear my own long hair out of the Roomba. Uh, so I can see where this is. It truly is an issue uh, if you live in a house where you're flying a drone and things are going to get caught inside of it. But it doesn't seem like a deal breaker. It just seems like something you should keep in mind. I was just surprised that people are still using Kickstarter. Are people still using Kickstarter like that? And some the, people are, Terrence. Some say people what? Are. Yeah. <laughs> they, some, they still are. People. I remember yeah. that was a big deal back in the day. Now I really don't hear about Kickstarter projects. But again, uh, maybe that's just me. Yeah, because it's not news anymore. Right? It ah, used to be news that somebody did yeah, something on Kickstarter. Gotcha. Then it was yeah, news that somebody yeah. did something weird on Kickstarter. Now it's just like, well, everything's on Kickstarter. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's what's going on there. And and, and honestly, uh, to Comey's point about inside, don't fly your drones inside. I I don't think uh, even Snap wants you to fly the Pixie inside. All, all their demo videos show it outside. So that's a that's a good reminder, Comey. Thanks well, for that. It depends on how high your ceiling is, but <laughs> your mileage may vary. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Get it? Especially your altitude mileage. <laughs> yeah. Well, Terrence Gaines, such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, you're a friend of the show, so we all know what you're doing, but let folks know that might not know the rest of your work where they can find it. Sure, sure, sure. So me and my co-host, Nika Montfort, we host a monthly Apple-centric podcast called Snob OS. Get it? Snob mm -hmm. and then OS. I don't know. Do people get that? I oh, hope, I, I hope yeah, that's yeah. I I get it. okay. Yeah. I, I hope people are getting what we we're trying to put out. Right. So uh, we, like I said, we do a weekly show where we talk all things Apple and then we have some other things where we spread, split off into social media and just things in general. So in addition to that, uh, myself and Rob Dunwood and Stephanie Humphrey, who are also friends of DTNS, we also host a tech show from a different perspective called the Tech John. So we talk about technology. We talk about how it relates to diversity, uh, things of that nature. So definitely can check us out there if you go to techjohn.com. And then in general, I'm on everything social media at Brother Tech, where I just talk about tech and just anything in general. So definitely uh, reach out to me that way if you want to get me the fastest. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. Also, we want to extend a special thanks to Steve Roger Prigg, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Steve. There's also a longer version of the show. It's called Good Day Internet. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, it's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. And for live viewers, we roll right into it right after we finish up this show. But just a reminder, on DTNS, we're live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we hope you all have a great weekend. And we'll be back doing it all again on Monday. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottus One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana and Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's shows include Patrick Norton, Justin Robert Young, and Terrence Gaines. And our guest this week was Dr. Kiki Sanford. Thanks to all the patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>